beautiful to, to honor mothers today, and it's such a blessing here today. I, one of the goals we have, one of the things the Lord has called us to do as a church is to reach people for Jesus Christ and to help people find out who they are in Christ and build them and equip them that they could be called into the ministry. Because we believe every single person is called into full-time ministry. Whether you're behind a pulpit or you're behind a, you're behind a school desk, whatever you're doing, God has called you to be in the ministry. And it's such a blessing to see people rise up and as God has doing it. And I just, the next person we're going to invite up here in a few moments is, uh, you know, if you may not know, her name is Jessica Landman. I've known her for 13 years. It's hard to believe that much time has gone by. But I met her when she was, uh, when she was eight years old. And <laughs> I met her and her husband, um, Chad, and it was just a blessing to grow with them and go to retreats together, pray together, talk together. And God has rose her up from being, uh, doing various things in the church, teaching woman Bible studies. And every time she, she teaches, there's a, there's a special, we call it an anointing. An anointing simply means God's power and presence upon you when she teaches. God has given her the gift of that. And she uh, is a graduate from UConn. She's also a graduate from our Bible school that we have here, Bible Institute, um, International School of Ministry. And she graduated from there, and she's been doing children's ministry. She started with that, women's ministry, started doing Bible studies, connections, discipleship. And she's been going on and on and rising up and rising up. And what she'll do is she'll learn something, then hand it over to somebody else. And that's what a real leader does, is equips other people. And she's been doing that, continues to do that, and she's been such a blessing. In fact, uh, she's also uh, has this great little book, My Daughter, and we all of it's called All Mascara is Not a Cre uh, Created Equal, that she just came up with. There's some in the lobby there. She didn't want to push it, said, I want to push it because I'm proud of you. She did a great job and uh, a great, great gift for graduation. And uh, I want to encourage you with that. But most of all, the most important thing is not gifting or ability. The most important thing is a heart, a servant heart like Christ that wants to serve and wants to exalt Jesus Christ. And when I saw her at a book launch uh, a little while ago, we had a little book party, and she stood up here, I heard the Lord say, that is a true woman of me. And I am blessed and I am honored to call Jessica Lamb not only a friend, but a fellow minister of the gospel. Would you please invite and welcome warm Jessica Lamb? She'll be bringing the message today. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate that nice, warm welcome. And honestly, when he asked me to speak here this morning, there was nothing I'd rather be doing on Mother's Day, besides spending time with my family, of course, than be able to speak into the body and to speak into the hearts of women. So thank you so much for inviting me here today. It's just, I've been excited all week. I know the Lord has put a word on my heart, and I can't wait to give it to you this morning. So happy Mother's Day. I'm not the first to wish you happy Mother's Day, but happy Mother's Day to all my moms out there today. What a great day where we can come together and honor the women in our lives who have sacrificed so much for us. And I am so blessed because I have had a mother who has loved me, sacrificed more than I will ever know, <laughs> and has prayed me into the woman I am today. So happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. And it's great that she's here this morning and she gets to listen to me speak. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know me, um, it's been a very interesting year for me. I have been in ministry, as Pastor mentioned, here serving in different capacities through the years. But the Lord has really put the heart of women on me. And this year we've been excited because we have launched Women Get Real Ministries, which is really to see all women become all that they are destined to be in Christ Jesus. And that's really my heart because I know that God has a purpose and a plan for every single one of you women out there. And so it's been really um, on my heart. So it's been an exciting year. And I do have two children of my own. I am a mother. I have a 14-year-old son and I have an almost 12-year-old daughter. So... Praise God, they're such a blessing to me. And I know what you're all thinking. You're thinking, wow, she must have had them when she was a teenager. So <laughs> don't let my useful looks fool you. I did have them when I was 24, Brett at 24. And I see you all doing the math, trying to figure out how old I actually am since Pastor met me when I was eight. So no, I am 38, <laughs> soon to be 39. And I am blessed beyond measure to have two beautiful children. And I have the privilege of call them my own, and I get to be their mother, so um, that's awesome. Um, 
before we get going, I do want to just open up in a word of prayer because I always want to, before I speak, I do want to pray. So again, if we could just bow our heads for a moment. Heavenly Father, we just commit this time unto you this morning. I pray, O oh Lord, that your word would be delivered in this place. I ask in your precious name that you would touch the heart of everybody here today, not just the moms. I know that this day, as Pastor mentioned, can be painful for many. Maybe some have not had the best relationship with their mothers, or some are struggling with the loss of a child or infertility, and that this is just a painful day. I ask, O oh Lord, that your peace would come in this place, that you would speak to everyone here, and you would bring your comfort, and that everyone would feel your love. And we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, we pray. And obviously, it's Mother's Day, so my message is going to be for the moms out there. But I ask you not to tune me out if you're not a mom, because I know that there is a message for everyone here today. So um, I promise if you hang with me, you'll, you'll be able to hear that. So with Mother's Day, what's interesting about it is just like when it's my kid's birthday, we start to reminisce and we start to reflect on the day. Like I know when my daughter's birthday is coming up and I'll spend the entire day, I think it's a mom thing, we just start reminiscing and okay this is the time I went to the hospital and this is the time when grandma and grandpa arrived and this is the time when I first held you in my arms and I think when Mother's Day comes we start to do the same thing we start to look back on the day that we found out that we're pregnant and I know today I started already thinking about the day I found out I was pregnant for the first time it was an amazing day um, to get that news and to be so excited and to know that you have a life that you're going to be responsible for, but you just instantly fall in love with that child and you begin to plan and dream over them and it's just an exciting time. And the funny thing with me is, is not too far after my celebration started, I found myself in my first down on my face moment with God. You see, my husband and I were away on a trip um, I was just seven weeks pregnant, and we were in this beautiful island of Antigua. Anybody been to Antigua? Okay. Oh, we got three of them. Okay. <laughs> Any case, um, we were in this remote resort, and um, it was beautiful. It was romantic. There was, uh, you know, private little rooms right on the beach. We had no television. We had no telephone, and of course, there was no cell service. And we were just celebrating this new life and this new chapter of our lives that we were going to embark on. And it sounds pretty romantic. It was until I started having symptoms of a miscarriage. And it was, oh, it was just a terrible experience. And I went to the lobby, if you could even call it that. It was an open-aired lobby with a thatched roof um, with one single hotel phone line in which I had to use to call my doctor back in Connecticut. And I started to explain to him the symptoms that I was having. And he told me, of course, that there was nothing that I had done wrong, but that it sounded pretty much like it was a miscarriage and just to enjoy the rest of my vacation. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sure, thank you. But he said it sounded pretty much um, irreversible. And so this romantic, I think they call it baby moon now, is that what they're calling it a day, just started to take a turn for the worse. So I sat there in this lobby, which again had no privacy because there was no phones in the room, and tears started to stream down my face, and my heart started to ache. And I just thought the symptom is irreversible and out of my control. And anybody who knows me knows that I like to control things. And so to be in that position out of my control just made me feel helpless. But it may have been out of my control, but it was not out of God's control. And I immediately turned to the Lord in prayer, and I started to plead with him, as any mother would have done at that moment. And so I started to pray and cry out, and he immediately brought me to a passage of Scripture, which I have looked upon many times in my life when I have been faced with situations that are out of my control. And it's found in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. And it says, do not be anxious about anything, by, um, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request unto God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Peace instantly came over me. I felt just God's love, and I knew that he was in it, but the symptoms continued. So we had one more night on the island, which uh, by my doctor's orders, I was supposed to enjoy the rest of my vacation. And I just continued to pray and believe God for a miracle. 
That night seemed like an awfully long time, and that flight home seemed like an eternity. And of course, I went straight to the doctor as soon as I got back. And to their surprise, but not mine, I was still pregnant. <laughs> and God was so faithful to me. And that baby is about to start high school <laughs> this fall. <laughs> and so I thank God. I thank God that God allowed me to go through that. And I know that there are some people here today who have gone through a similar experience, but their outcome was different than mine. And I'm so sorry because I just got a glimmer of what that pain feels like. And I know that it's a trying time to go through. My heart goes out to each and every one of you. But you see, for me, God allowed me to go through this experience on purpose. He was trying to teach me at the very, very beginning of my pregnancy that I was going to have to be a woman of great prayer, that no matter what things I did, no matter how good of a mother I could be, that the best thing I can do for my children was to be a woman of great prayer. And now my daughter's entrance into the world was very different, but I promise you, it was no less dramatic. <laughs> I'll save that story for a different day, but I guarantee you it brought me right back to where I was with my son on my knees in prayer, praying for him and bringing him into the world. And again, it was a reminder from the Lord that not just my first child, but every child is a child that we need to contend for in prayer, that we need to be on our knees for in prayer. And, you know, I know that as moms, we sometimes feel like we're supposed to be perfect. I loved our intro this morning with the super mom image. And I think that as moms, we feel like we are supposed to be everything. But God never called us to be perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect mom. But the good news is, is there is a perfect God. And that is the best thing that we have. And I confess, I'm not going to lie. I bought all the books. <laughs> you know, you have the what to expect when you're expecting book. But did you know that there's what to expect the first year and what to expect the toddler years? And there's everybody's opinion about what you're supposed to do. And I read them all. And I decided that I was going to do everything in my power to be the best mom that I can. I did the tummy time, you know, to make sure that their upper body strength was strong. I bought all, all, and I mean all the baby Einstein videos so that they would be exposed to all that classical music, you know, at an early age. I did flashcards with them so that their vocabulary was strong and solid. I even spoke to them, yes, I did, in French and Spanish, especially my first one, 15 minutes a day when they were babies because I had heard that if you expose them to language at an early age, that their ability to learn it later in life would be strong. And I, I, I will admit that they are very good in languages, so, <laughs> but I did do that. I even went as far as to expose them to different textiles because I had heard that they, you, know, you didn't want them to have sensory issues. So I would take rough, bumpy things and silky, smooth things and just run it through their little fingers so they didn't have... My mom's laughing because she saw me do it. She laughed at me. I wish I was making this stuff up, people, but I, I honestly and truly did all this because... I felt like if I can do all these things for my kids, that they were going to be turning, you know, they would turn out good. And yes, I mean, there is some truth to that. You know, we are called to be good parents, but we need to, to make sure that, you know, our hearts are in the right place. Yes, but we're not perfect. And no matter what we do for our kids, no matter what labors we do for them, there is no guarantee that they're going to turn out okay. You could be the best parent in the world, but... That's not going to guarantee anything. And what the Lord told me is, is that we are not called to be perfect as moms. We are called to be prayers. I'll say that to you again. We are not called to be perfect, but we are called to be a praying mom who gets down on her knees and contends for her kids each and every single day. Now, Paul in the New Testament, we know about Paul, who was a master of living a life of prayer, tells us to devote our lives to prayer in Colossians 4.1, being watchful and thankful. And he also instructs us later to pray without ceasing, meaning that we are continually to be in an attitude of prayer for our kids because we, we love our kids. We want the best for them, and the best thing we can do for them is to pray for them. Now, I know 
this message already is probably bringing a little bit of relief to some of you moms out there. Because honestly, Mother's Day, as I said, brings a lot of mixed emotions for people. Some of you today may feel a little bit like a fraud. Some of you may feel like a fraud sitting here being honored on Mother's Day. Maybe just this morning, you yelled at your kids before you came here to get them ready and going, and you lost your temper, which you said yesterday that you weren't going to do. Or maybe your child is living right now in rebellion or going through a rebellious phase, and you thought you did everything right, but you're sitting here sad, just pleading for your child, wondering what you did wrong and why they are living in this wayward way. Or maybe just yesterday you... <laughs> We're about to head to a baseball game, and you realize that your son's baseball uniform was at the bottom of the laundry. And although it was Saturday and his last game was the previous Sunday, you couldn't believe that it was still dirty and he needed to be at the game in a couple of hours. So you quickly washed it and threw it in the dryer. But because it wasn't dry, you had to take a hair dryer to it, and your son went to the game with a damp uniform on. And I'm just, that's just hypothetical. It's not specific to anyone here. Just hypothetically speaking. Sorry, Brett. <laughs> or maybe you sent in store-bought cookies to the bake sale instead of those minion cupcakes that you saw on Pinterest. You know the ones. Do we have? I was looking on Pinterest the other day. Can I just tell you something as a side note? <laughs> Aren't they cute? <laughs> It's a little squashed on the image, but, you know, you sent in store-bought cookies. You didn't have time to, to get the little hostess Twinkies and do all the coloring. Let me tell you something about Pinterest. It's a really great website to get ideas, but if you are feeling bad as a mom, I'm telling you right now, stay off of Pinterest. It is like the devil's workshop for fueling inferiority and in moms. There's something that happens. There's like this competition that gets brewed or, or whatnot. But I'm just telling you, if you are having a bad mommy day, stay off of Pinterest. I just spent a couple minutes and I'm thinking, wow, who, who has the time to do all this stuff <laughs> or the energy to even post it on Pinterest? But I have good news for you. If you are feeling like you are not the best mom in the world or you're having one of those days, you are in good company. And I'm not just talking about the women sitting next to you today. Right now, I just want to spend a portion of our time looking into scripture in the Bible where we could look at the lives of some moms who you would otherwise would think were great mothers who had their moments of imperfection as well. So if you would turn to Genesis chapter 27, verse 5. So we look on to Rebecca, who was the wife of one of the patriarchs of Israel, okay, Isaac. And it was Jewish tradition to bless the eldest son before the father would pass on. It was just what they did. The father would come, he would lay hands on, on the oldest son and pass along a special blessing. And we see in the beginning of Genesis chapter 27, Isaac having a conversation with his son Esau. He tells him to go hunt some wild game and prepare for him some, I love what the, my version says, some tasty food for him. And then he will pass along the blessing. And so we jump on the scene with Rebecca because Rebecca had just overheard this conversation. So starting in verse 5 of Genesis chapter 27, it reads, Now Rebecca was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare for me some tasty food to eat, um, so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Nice mom, huh? <laughs> Talk about playing favorites in between twins, no less. She obviously had a favorite son, and she was being deceptive. She thought it would be a good idea, now this is a, a godly woman, to deceive her husband with her son into passing along the blessing to her favorite son, lying to him and kind of cohorting with him. Hmm. 
Now, God had already planned this and did not need Rebecca's hands in this. But she decided to take matters into her own hands and to push God's hand. You know, I look at this and I say those store-bought cookies really don't look that bad after all, do they? When you see a mom like this. The next mom I want to talk about is found in Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, if you'd like to read along. And this is James and John's mother. And we hear this account very often, but I still thought it would be appropriate to talk about on Mother's Day. So chapter 20 of Matthew, starting with verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is, you want? what is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may see it, sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? And they answered, we can. Talk about embarrassing, right? <laughs> You're sitting there with Jesus, the Messiah, the chosen one, and she has the audacity to go up to him and be like, hey, can you show a little favoritism to my boys? They're pretty cool. And she starts talking them up. And not only did she have the guts to do this, but she also caused a lot of dissension among the disciples because afterwards they started to get out of their nose, out of joy. Well, who do they think they are? So she, you know, you know, I know moms will do anything for their kids, you know, going up to the coach, talking to the teacher, trying to promote their kid. But we've got a, a mother here who had the audacity to walk up to the Messiah and say, hey, can you show a little favoritism to him? I mean, that takes some pretty guts. So again, if you're having a bad mom moment, here's another mom. And then the last mom that I want to talk to you about today is Mary. Yes, Mary, Jesus's mother. I love this story. It just brings <laughs> a chuckle on my face every time I read it. So if you would, our last scripture where we're going to look at moms today um, in this context is found in Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Starting right with verse 41. Every year, Jesus's parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a whole day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem and looked for him after Three days. Look it to your neighbor and say, Jesus was missing for three days. <laughs> After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. How many of you realize that Jesus was missing for four days? One day, they didn't even know he was gone, and then they looked for him for three days. Jesus was missing. Mary, the mother of God who was entrusted with this great gift, lost, or shall we say misplaced, her son for four days. Four. And he turned out okay. <laughs> so rest assured that if you're having a bad mother moment, that you are in good company. And that your kids are going to be okay as long as we surrender them and give them over to the Lord. Now, I share these mother moments with you um, for a little levity, of course, but certainly not to give an excuse to be a bad parent. I don't want anyone walking out of here saying, oh, well, you know, there were some bad moms in the Bible, so I don't really have to do that much. I don't have to do all that crazy stuff that I hear about. I don't want you to think of it at all. But I want you to know that prayer will make you more Christ-like and will help you to be the mother that your children need you to be. But no matter how textbook perfect you are, there is no guarantee that your kid is going to come out unscathed. But prayer will do that because prayer is the best gift that you can give your children. Because remember, God never called you to be perfect. He called you to be a prayer. He called you to be an interceder. He called you to get on your knees daily and fight for your kids in prayer. And I like to look at the life of Hannah. We all know the account of Hannah, or most of us do. 
She, her account is in the story of um, in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Um, and she was the mother to Samuel, one of the mighty men of Israel. And we enter the scene in that chapter with her crying out to the Lord. For you see, her husband had two wives, which was the custom of that time. And his first wife was blessed with children. And she used to provoke Hannah and sort of lord it over her that she was the fertile one, to say the least. And, and Hannah was saddened. And her husband, of course, would say, don't you know that I love you? I'd give you double portions. Isn't that good enough? Well, it wasn't. It wasn't good enough for Hannah. And she cried out to the Lord in her desperation, and God honored that plea and granted her a child, not just any child, but Samuel, who was this mighty man of God. But I have to ask myself the question, why is this story even included in, in Scripture? What is so special about this particular mother? What's so special about this account? Why doesn't Samuel open up where he's serving under Eli in the house of God already? Why did the Lord feel it was important to include this passage of Scripture for us to read later on in years? I'll tell you why. Or I wouldn't have asked the question. Because there is significance in her desperation. Because out of Hannah's desperation sparked an intense prayer life. One that prayed a child into existence. Before he was even conceived in her womb, she prayed for this child. And I'm sure she prayed for this child all the way until she released him into the care of the Lord. And I'll tell you what, although scripture doesn't say so, I can guarantee you that Hannah prayed for Samuel every single day of his life or of her life, I should say. And that is why Samuel is one of the mighty men of Israel who was the final judge and who was the prophet who anointed the first two kings, King Saul and King David, because that is the result of a mama who is in the back scene praying for her kids. We need to get desperate for our children. We need to just cry out for them. We are in a battle. The devil loves to target youth. He loves to just get at them because, you see, revival is always or almost always ushered in by the up-and-coming generation. And if he knows that he can get his hands on them, then he is successful. There is a destiny. Every youth in this place today, God has a plan and a destiny for your life and a perfect path and an order and a calling, no matter if you're a pastor or you're a teacher or wherever you put your foot. But God has a plan for you. And the devil wants to stop that plan, and he will do everything and anything to stop it. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a hungry lion looking for someone to devour. That someone is your child. I'm not trying to scare you because you have the power in prayer, but we need to be wise to these things as a mother. We need to realize that they are in the fight of their lives, and we are their best line of defense behind the scenes praying for them and pouring out our heart for them. You know, times are very different these days. This generation has it harder than any generation before. And I hear people say all the time, oh, I know how hard it is to be a kid. Oh, I remember those days. It's difficult. You have no idea what it's like to be a kid today. It is very different. You never had to contend with what kids have to contend with today. It is so different. Sure, alcoholism, drugs, smoking, promiscuity, yes, those were always issues and always will be issues, and we need to cover them with prayer. But our kids today are dealing with Internet access right at their fingertips. They have to deal with texting, camera phones, cyberbullying, and all the different social media. Everything you do, all their actions are documented on everybody else's social media page. You have one bad day, and it's out there. You have no idea what it's like for them to be a kid, and they need to know that their parents are behind them, supporting them, praying for them. 
We need to be fighting for them. I love what it says in Lamentations. Jeremiah says in Lamentations 2.19, pour out your heart like water before the Lord. Lift up your hands for them for the life of your children. And I feel like that is our obligation as parents to be pouring out our heart for them daily so that they know that we are behind them in prayer and that they are covered with his blood. We, like Hannah, are in desperate times, and desperate times call for desperate measures. We need to be praying for them. And so often, we are so busy trying to get the Parent of the Year Award that we're missing what's really important. The best gift we can give our kids is to be interceding and praying for them. You see, prayer changes things. Prayer moves mountains. Prayer tugs at the heartstrings of God, which moves him to compassion. We see all throughout the New Testament, Jesus moving with compassion, and that's what our prayers do. Prayer calls things that are not as if they are. Prayers have the power to change the future and impact history, just like Hannah did with Samuel. Now, I know some of you are not comfortable with prayer. It's just something that you've never done. You're not exactly sure how to pray, what to pray. Maybe you've been brought up in different cultures or, or churches, and you've recited prayers that have already been put together, and that's great because God honors any prayer. But I want to give you a couple of tips that I have found very helpful and I've learned along the way um, as a mom who prays, and I think that they will be beneficial for you. The first tip is let your kids see you pray. As I said, it is very important for them to know that you are praying for them, that you're behind them, that you know that it's a hard road out there, and that you love them, and that you are behind them. I remember growing up, I remember it vividly. I know we've had many couches since then, but I could see my mom sitting on the living room couch. It was kind of a light blue color with, with blue in it, and she would have her Bible open, and dinner would be cooked, and we would be outside playing, and we'd come in the house, and I would see her just devouring that word of God, and I would hear her praying and lifting up my brother and I in prayer. And, you know, at the time, I didn't think much of it, but as I got older, I just knew that I had a mom behind me praying me in every situation, and it gave me confidence. And before I left the house every morning for school and even up until I got married, she would literally anoint me with oil and she would cover me because she knew she wanted the presence of the Holy Spirit to go with me because she knew it was tough out there. And she wanted to let me know, one, that she was praying, and two, that the Holy Spirit was being sent with me. And I know that's what her prayers were. So let your kids see you pray. Let them hear you pray. Pray for them. I know my husband every Sunday night praise, a special prayer over the kids, whatever they have coming that week, so that we could take on the week together in prayer, because it's tough out there. The second tip is to pray specifically, not generically. I hear a lot of people say, oh, just bless my kids. And, and again, that's wonderful. But God is a God of detail. God wants us to play out all the different requests unto him. I pray that God would protect them. I pray that God would give them good health. I pray that they would learn to, to respect other people, that they would learn to have good relationships. I pray that they would find the Lord early in life and that they would never deviate from that path. I pray oh, that their, the conviction would come upon them if they are a sin. And you know what else I pray? Sorry, guys. <laughs> I pray that if they're doing something wrong, that they get caught and that I find out about it. Because that's the best, yes, <laughs> because that's the kind of praying moms that we need to be. They're going to make mistakes, yes, but I pray that any time, and I know that the Holy Spirit is going to be faithful, and if they're doing something wrong, my spirit will be alerted so that I can jump in before it gets out of hand. Pray specifically. Pray specifically. And pray for everything. Again, I've heard people say, well, I don't want to pray for more than their protection and health because I don't want to overload God. Really? 
the creator of the universe, you don't want to overload him. The word of God says, cast all your cares upon him. Not just some of them, not just the biggies. You know, God cares if your kid makes the soccer team. God cares if they do well on their science test. God cares if they have good friends in school. We can't be afraid to ask the Lord for everything. He is there. He'll decide if it's not something in his will. But you ask in boldness. You know, people say, oh, I don't want to ask if it's not his will. You know what? Of course we pray his will. But at the same token, I always pray, Lord, if it's not your will, then you shut the door. But I'm going to pray and ask for it anyway. And the more you pray, the more in line your prayers are going to be. They are going to be right in sync with the Lord, and your spirit is going to bear witness, and you're going to know how to pray for your kids. Also, know your authority. You are their parents. And there is an order of things. God has an appointed order. There is a spirit world out there, and they know the authority. The question is, do you? You are the head of that household, you and your husband, and you have the authority to pray and speak life into your kids and speak blessing into your kids. You just need to know it. So you have the boldness to approach the throne of God and petition God and plead with him and know that you have the right to do so. And the last thing and the last tip, which I have found extremely useful, is to pray the word of God. The word, the Bible is full of promises and scriptures for our children. Why not use God's words when we pray? If we don't know what to pray, use his very own words. I know, for example, just to give you a little example of what I do. I might start off the day reading 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So you want to know what I do? I literally will pray, no temptation has seized Brett or Jenna except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let Brett or Jenna be tempted beyond what they can bear. But when they are tempted, he will also provide a way out for them so that they can endure it. And then I continue my prayer on for that. Or perhaps I'll be reading in Psalm, and this is one of my favorite scriptures, and honestly, I can tell you that I pray this every single day, Psalm 91.10. And it says there, for he will command his angels concerning Brett and Jenna, and of course you would fill in your own child's name there. (laughs) Just making sure you're tracking with me. But you're more than welcome to pray for my kids every day as well. Um, to guard them in all our ways. And then I will continue on. So, Lord Jesus, wherever Brett or Jenna place their foot today, I pray that your warring angels surround them. I ask that you will cover them with the blood of Jesus. I pray that you would keep them out of harm's way. I pray, O oh Lord, that if they are going down a path that is not of you, that you would move out of it. And that is what we need to do. We have a responsibility to pray for our children, but we have a responsibility to pray for other children too, not just ours If you are not a parent and you're sitting here saying, what does this have to do with me? Now is the time to tune in. Because God is raising up spiritual mothers and fathers to intercede for children. You know, Nasa and Freddie and Kip and Shyla and Doris do an awesome job of teaching our kids every week. They intercede for them. They pour into them. And they are literally covering with the blood of Jesus. And I am so appreciative to have it. But the church needs to rally around our youth, the entire church, which is I'm so excited that we're about to embark on the new phase of our church because children matter children matter and moms and spiritual moms and spiritual dads it's time to get on them if they don't find the lord now the statistics are just devastating about them finding the lord later in life we need to pour into them now and we need to tell them that they are first in our lives too that we have this for us but we have this incredible space for them too so i'm asking you if you are not a parent or if you are a parent i'm asking you to make a commitment this day that you will choose friend um, friends children or somebody else in this church and you would make a commitment to God to pray faithfully for some of the youth in this church they need us to come together I hate to say it but it does take a village it takes a church it takes a church to come around them and they need to know that 
You know, I believe I am who I am today because of the prayers of my parents, because of the prayers of my mother, because I knew that she fought for me. I know that she fought on her knees and she contended for me every single day. And I knew that mattered. And I vowed that I would do the same thing for my kids. And in closing, I just want to share a story that I heard about George Washington and his mother, Mary Washington. It's a great article, and it says this. George Washington, the father of our country, changed the course of American history for God's glory. His overwhelming reputation of humility, perseverance, dignity, honor, strength, and sincerity was second to none. He was just not a military and revolutionary hero. He was a shining example of one enlisted in the army of God. The King of Kings was his leader and none other. George's mother, Mary Washington, raised him and his siblings as a single mother after his dad died when he was 10. She found her strength in God alone. It is recorded that she went to a nearby rock outside of her house to pray continually. George wrote letters to his mother while in the battlefield of the Revolutionary War, proving that her prayers were doing for him um, what she wanted. He wrote that he escaped death when bullets went through his coat and horses were shot out from under him. Miracle after miracle happened to George, and he honored his mother with these words, All that I am, I owe to my mother. George Washington knew many of his triumphs happened because of his mother's pleading prayers on his behalf. She prayed diligently and birthed a God-fearing, courageous leader. I want to be a mother like Mary Washington. I want to pray my children's destiny into place. I want to know that I have the power to impact history like Mary Washington did. And it all starts with prayer. But remember, God never called us to be perfect, but he did call us to be a prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, O oh Lord, for this opportunity to share this word that you put on my heart. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would rise up women in this, in our midst, lionesses pleading for their children in prayer, O oh Lord. I pray also that you would raise spiritual mothers and fathers to rally around this youth, O oh Lord, because we know that revival is on the wings of our youth, Lord God. I ask in Jesus' name for boldness to come into the throne room and to petition for our children, covering them in prayer, O oh Lord. I ask, O oh Lord, just for, just for peace, Lord. This message was not at all to be in fear, but to bring knowledge, because with wisdom comes knowledge and brings us to action. So in the name of Jesus, I pray, O oh Lord, for praying mothers to rise up. In your precious name, we pray. Amen. I'm going to hand it over to Pastor now. Appreciate it so much. and What a great word that we can all learn from. And You know, I was thinking as she was sharing this morning, I, I, uh, my wife and I, we we're raising our own kids as well. We wish we were perfect, and we're not. But I tell you, one of the, my favorite scriptures says, love covers a multitude of sins. And isn't it nice to know that? That, you know, I believe that if we love God and let his love touch us and show love to other people, it, love covers a multitude of sins. And the greatest covering that ever was and ever will be is through Jesus Christ. He died for imperfect people like you and me. You're going to mess up. It doesn't give, doesn't give us a license to mess up. But when we do, we have an advocate to the Father for us. He says, hey, my son, my daughter messed up today, but they called upon me, Father. And what I did on the cross is enough to pay for that. So you don't have to live with a guilty conscience. You don't have to live like, oh, I, I can't do it. Well, guess what? You can't. But love covers a multitude of sins. Jesus covers question I want to ask you today is, are you covered? Are you covered by his love? Maybe you're a believer and you're giving your life to Jesus Christ and you're ready are covered, but it's good every day to say, God, I ask you to forgive me of my sins and cover me with your love. When you love well, God comes and his grace is upon you. But maybe some of you else are trying real hard. Listen, you can't save yourself. I don't care how good of a parent you are or good of an uncle or an aunt you are. You're never good enough because you and I are not perfect, and God is. And only he can pay that price through Jesus Christ. 
And so every week, I want to give you an opportunity, if you haven't done it already, to give your life to Jesus Christ. It's the best decision you will ever make, and it will transform your life and make your life on this planet better and for eternity be with Him. Because there is a place called hell. There's a place called hell at the end of your life. If you don't know Jesus Christ and you don't have His covering on you, then the choice is to be without Him for eternity. I can't imagine that. So I want to give you an opportunity today to, to give your life to Christ. If you just bow your heads and as we pray a prayer. Father, we thank you so much for dying on the cross through Jesus Christ for us. I thank you that you paid for our, our sins, all the sins we'd ever do and all the sins that we'll ever would do. We thank you for the account that you have set up for us that we can draw from that account by writing a check of prayer to you asking for forgiveness. And Father, we thank you for that many, that amazing love of Jesus Christ that came to us. And today we recognize the fact that we don't want to do this without you anymore. And so, Lord Jesus, if you want to pray this prayer in your quietness of your heart, Lord Jesus, I give my life to you today. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, both known and unknown, all the things I've done wrong. And I recognize I'm not good enough and never will be. But I thank you that you are good enough. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I place my trust in you. I ask you to be the commander of my life. You would now call the shots and I don't. You are in the driver's seat from this point forward. Fill me with your grace. Fill me with your ability with your power, I will walk all my days for you in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, I just say quickly, if someone prayed that prayer, maybe the first time, or I just want to know so I can pray for you better, and we want to help. Anyone today pray that prayer today? Just quickly, just put your hand up quickly to see. Okay. Let's conclude with one more last song. We're going to ask our, our, our prayer team to come up. Listen, it's wonderful to gather together, to pray together, to touch God together, and believe. Let's go ahead and ask them on if you could. You don't stand. Love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours. No mountain high or valley low. I'll sing out and remind my soul that I Bless you today. May his love cover and surround you in Jesus' name. If you don't want a prayer, please come up. Otherwise, we dismiss you. Happy Mother's Day, and God bless you.